Thanks. <laughs> it's good to be here. Um, so I'm here today to talk about uh, Mantle. And uh, Mantle is a really exciting project I've been working together with Man uh, AMD on for, for, for quite some time now. Uh, Mantle is really a low-level graphics API uh, with, and with the main goal of, of improving performance and making it easier to develop advanced uh, game engines uh, in general. So we've been working with uh, adding support in our engine, Frostbite, uh, and specifically for Valve 54. Um, and this is, uh, <clears throat> this has been going, oh, damn it. My slides are auto-advancing. They should not be auto-advancing. Please disable that. Please go back and disable auto-advance. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, let's start, restart a little bit. Um, so, it, it, the main goal of Mantle is to improve performance and to simplify advanced uh, game development. Uh, and we really want to try and give developers a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of freedom to be able to build innovative graphics solutions. And I think also Mantle is a, is a little bit of a method for us to sort of challenge uh, the way things are done and, and challenge the status quo uh, and make interesting games. So, so going forward, uh, this talk is really about uh, um, how Mantle works for, for developers. We have some learnings uh, that I'm going to share of what we, the work we've been doing with Frostbite, but also, uh, in general, just going through the various areas of, of Mantle and how it can impact uh, developers. So you can sort of see that in, in five different areas uh, of how we can give more control, how we can improve performance and programmability and, and sort of a little bit about various platforms. Uh, so starting on, when it comes to control, uh, we have a, um, the, the model that we have in, in, in my slides are still auto advancing. Please disable that. Okay, I think they are disabled. Okay, perfect. So, with Mantle, so with Mantle we have a. Uh, a model that we like to call a, a lot more explicit model than the sort of traditional model of, of DirectX and OpenGL. Uh, we're uh, working on a, a much thinner, lower level abstraction that exposes how hardware really works uh, compared to DX and GL that's a little bit, we could say, the middle ground abstraction. It's a compromise between performance and, and usability. And unfortunately for us, everyone sort of has to work on that. Um, with Mantle, we, we moved to a lower level and one way that that sort of shows up very clearly is that uh, we've moved to be able to work with memory a lot more explicitly. Uh, that's a, memory is a responsibility of the application uh, compared to in DX and GL, uh, the traditional models where memory is hidden away uh, as a, behind resource objects and state for resources is hidden as well. Um, with, um, um, th this also enables our resources to become globally accessible I instead of uh, having to go through a, a device context like you do in DX where all resource updates go through a specific object in order to be pipelined and, and update this uh, sort of hidden memory and hidden, hidden resource state. Uh, and this leads to some pretty interesting, uh, <coughs> pretty interesting behavior. If my slides can advance, yes. Uh, where we can manually describe the behavior. Okay, I guess they're changing my slides now, great. Uh, okay. Um, so we go back to a, a model where, uh, where what the state of resources is uh, explicitly, explicitly defined by applications and we also have to uh, transition uh, them manually between, for example, if you use the render tar use the texture as a render target initially, and then you want to use it as a texture, that's an, uh, an operation that uh, your application have to explicitly define uh, compared to how it works in, in DX, where uh, the driver is actually quite a complex driver that analyzes every single draw call uh, and goes through them and see if you're setting a texture, was this used as a render target before? It has to sort of implicitly uh, do various operations uh, for them. Uh, so this, this brings on uh, quite a few different interesting uh, new responsibilities onto applications. And uh, you have to, well, um, d describe the case of, uh, of render targets and how you have to sort of transition them manually from between the various states. Uh, there's a lot of other types of, of transitions that applications have to do. Uh, 
Um, but there's also things like with explicit memory management, you can't just delete the resource that's being used by a GPU uh, while, uh, yeah, while it's running. It will essentially crash. The application is responsible to make sure the lifetime of resources uh, are, it's tracked properly, there's refenses or, or tracking them over frames. And uh, functionality like uh, dynamic resources that exist in, in DX and GL where you, the driver automatically does uh, resources renaming under the hood becomes the application's responsibility instead. Uh, similar also with memory tiling, where you tile resources for, for performance. Uh, so this is quite a lot of responsibilities to take on, and it's not really for everyone, for, for all applications. Uh, uh, but we, we do get quite a lot out of this. And there's also a validation layer in Mantle that's a really powerful component uh, uh, to help with these things, to make it easier to take on all of this responsibility. Uh, so what, uh, what does all of this uh, give us? Uh, there's quite a few things that we, in a, as an application and a game engine, we, know, we have the information about our full scenes, so we know what we're rendering, we know what we're simulating, we know where all of the objects are in our scenes, and we can adapt these uh, use cases uh, in order to um, do various types of performance and memory optimizations uh, for this based on this full scene information, this high-level information that the drivers uh, in traditional models do not have. Um, and one concrete example for that is that uh, on the consoles, we often use uh, linear frame allocators uh, because we have explicit memory access on, on consoles and usually, usually unified uh, memory. So linear frame allocators are pretty trivial to implement in, in Mantle as well, uh, where instead of tracking every single object, you essentially just use larger um, memory heaps and, and linearly increment, uh, increment on them. Uh, we also know how we stream uh, in data um, <coughs> within our game engines, how we load various sections of our levels, and it's fairly trivial to connect that together with uh, specific memory pools and just load and uh, treat memory as a big hole as we're loading, we know how our games are, are loading that data. Um, we can also use pin memory, for example, if we know that both the CPU and GPU will cooperate on the same uh, memory location. And overall, an, an important thing with this explicit control that, uh, is that it enables us as sort of large advanced uh, game engines and applications, it actually reduces the development time for us overall. The initial time to get something up and running is a little bit longer than with the traditional model, but the overall time of getting to, to, to sort of what good looks like when it comes to performance and robustness uh, is, is uh, reduced. Um, because we, we, we can take on, take on more work initially and, and utilize that um, across multiple titles. So there, there are a couple of other things that gets enabled by uh, this explicit control. One is transient resources. Uh, in the traditional model, res render targets are a pretty big complex resource that you have to sort of create upfront, uh, and that takes a lot of memory, especially in the modern type of rendering pipelines that we have today. Uh, with this explicit memory management, we can alias these render targets and save a lot of memory. We don't have to pre-allocate everything. It's actually easier to use. And with a lot of responsibility being moved from the driver over to the application, the hope is also that the actual driver uh, will become significantly easier to develop and, and maintain and, of course, reduce CPU overhead. So that brings me into CPU performance and how that sort of impacts with Mantle. And we have a couple of different components here that, that are important, or a co couple of different concepts. Uh, there are um, three key concepts uh, that I would say in Mantle. One is uh, descriptor sets, and one is monolithic pipelines, and also command buffers, and I'll go through them here briefly. Uh, so descriptor sets is really a way of um, how you tell which resources to use on the GPU. Uh, resources in a traditional model are bound by usually a one-to-one -one basis of rebinding textures to individual shader stage. Uh, this replaces that with a large uh, resource table of quite simple resources. Either you have images that could be textures or UAVs or anything image-like, uh, or you have simply memory, which is essentially buffers or, or just raw views of things as well as uh, samplers, and then you can also link between resources. And uh, this is a quite interesting model. It's a little bit difficult to wrap your head around it, but um, uh, there, there are, I have a couple of examples here of how it can work. And all of, all of these resources are, uh, descriptor sets are managed by the application. So there's a lot of opportunity to, uh, to optimize for a specific type of, of cases that you have in your game engine. So here's one very simple example. This is actually probably not the most ideal way of doing it, but this, this works. It simulates a little bit how it works in DX and GL. So here we have a single dynamic descriptor set. So we, we, with a bunch of resources, we have a vertex buffers, we have a vertex constants used by the uh, vertex shader, and we have three textures and a sampler as well. So these are the resources that will be accessible for the following draw calls, essentially. Uh, this is very similar to how it works in DX and GL, except that you see one of the textures, the texture zero, is being used by both the vertex shader and pixel shader, uh, but, but it's represented just by, by a single slot. 
Um, so this is a simple way of get, get things up and running. Um, but a more interesting case um, is uh, this, where many of our objects are actually uh, static, or not necessarily the data of them, but uh, the list of references that we have for them. When we load in the mesh, we know that it's going to use a, well, it's definitely going to use a vertex buffer, it's going to use a couple of textures. Usually we know all of this up front, and the samplers, which is the, like the texture filtering modes and stuff like that, are the same. They're usually very, really quite static. So we can actually just allocate a, a static descriptor set up front and just link to that one. So every, for every draw call, we have some dynamic vertex contents in this case, and we just link to the static descriptor set. So we don't have to go through and set uh, all of these resources for every single draw call. It significantly reduces uh, overhead here. Uh, and this model is actually closer to how hardware actually um, works, um, and so it's efficient on that level as well. Uh, another of the concepts I mentioned are pipelines. So uh, in Mantle, all the different shader stages are merged together to a single uh, object, uh, together with uh, important uh, pipeline stages such as what type of uh, render target write mask you have, or alpha blending modes, or, or some select uh, graphic state. So all this is put together into a single object, and the reason for that is that we can completely avoid the runtime compilation uh, within the driver uh, or, or patching of these shaders. And it's up to the application to create these objects. You could create them dynamically uh, if you want. It would be similar to, to how drivers work today. Um, and perhaps you have a very dynamic use case, so you have to. But uh, ideally, you should create these a uh, little bit more, uh, well, uh, statically, or and you can even cache them on, on, on disk. Um, and that can significantly improve performance also just business switching between lots and lots of shaders. Uh, there can be some impacts on memory when it comes to these things, but uh, uh, modern machines have quite a lot of memory, so it's usually not, not too bad. Uh, and the last thing, it's pretty simple, it's just command buffers. Uh, uh, all the existing drivers work with this uh, already. This is just a layer on it that actually exposes uh, it to the, to the to the application in an efficient manner. So you bind the graphic state, the descriptor sets I mentioned, the pipelines you want, you do your draw calls, you set some high level state like render targets, and all these are completely independent objects that are uh, really efficient to create and you can have multiple ones per frame. You can even reuse them if you, if you want to. And this is in contrast to how it works in, in the traditional models. Um, so in DX and GL, you have something that looks sort of like this. So here's essentially three frames. Uh, the game is being rendered, uh, being updated on CPU zero. When the game is sort of getting more, uh, game frame is being done, we, we, we do a rendering thread uh, that uh, <coughs> issues our D3D or OpenGL commands. And then uh, the driver uh, takes all of those commands and, and it essentially just records them and plays it back on its own thread. And this model is quite good in the average case, actually, because it, it automatically gives you um, a lot of, uh, it sort of extracts out a lot of parallelism automatically for you. Uh, so it scales quite nicely for, uh, for a large set of apps, but it scales very badly to, <laughs> to many CPU cores, uh, and it's quite limited in that way, and it also adds a, additional latency, and this specific driver thread can collide and become a bottleneck. We see that quite often in, in Frostbite. So with Mantle, we can do this instead, which looks a lot more nicer. Uh, where we have the game thread running as three frames here, and then in the end of the frame, we just go wide and, and update our rendering. Uh, and this has a lot of benefits. We can scale much more nicely. Uh, we don't have any driver sets that can collide. It's lower latency. And this is actually the exact model that we're using on all of the consoles, both the, old, uh, the, current, the last generation consoles and the current generation consoles. Um, and with Mantle, we can do this on PC as well, which we do uh, with great performance improvements, which uh, leads me into GPU performance. Uh, so thanks to all of the sort of CPU performance improvements that I've been talking about, uh, CPU should, with Mantle should never really be a bottleneck for, for the GPU anymore. Uh, so you could actually use the CPU to uh, help the GPU a little bit more, do a little bit less brute force rendering. Sometimes we have to brute force this through because we're so limited by draw calls, or it can improve calling, or just spend the excess CPU time on the overall game. Uh, either is fine, of course. Um, and, but there are, there are also other optimizations that can be done with Mantle. The monolithic shader pipelines that I mentioned gives the driver quite a lot of opportunity to, to optimize its uh, usage. It can actually optimize um, based, on this, um, uh, based on this overall knowledge of how all of the, uh, the stages are connected and, and see if there's some cross-optimizations that can, can be done from that. Uh, so it's nice to be able to give the driver in, in critical areas some extra opportunity here. Um, we also, with the resource states, is in a similar fashion there. Uh, where the driver gets full explicit information on when we need to switch between various states, and us as an application can also see if we're actually switching a lot that could actually result in lower performance, so this becomes explicit and easier to track. And 
finally, there are a bunch of um, sort of existing GPU functionality that's not really exposed in, in DX that, that we can use. Uh, simple things like just extra primitives, quads, and rec lists for, for efficient uh, uh, 2D rendering. Um, and a little bit more complex things like MSAA, um, where, where you can use specific uh, hardware acceleration structures uh, and expose those and to, to us as a developer. Um, and all modern GPUs are really quite uh, complex, heterogeneous uh, machines uh, that have multiple uh, individual engines. So you have the graphics pipeline as one engine, you have one or multiple uh, compute pipelines, and you may have DMA transfer to just transfer memories, uh, or like video encode or image encode and decode. And Mantle exposes these as uh, queues for these individual engines uh, together with synchronization primitives. And this can, uh, so here's an example of just in Mantle, for example, just we recorded a command buffer with graphics commands and we're submitting it to the, to the uh, graphics queue that we have uh, together with some metadata that, uh, that it needs to be able to execute. So we just add work to in the, into these individual queues and the system and, and GPU will just pick up this work and you can all do all these in, independently. And there are a lot of cool use cases that it gets enabled by, by these queues. So a very simple case here is uh, asynchronous DMAs. Uh, here we, we, instead of blocking on, on blocking the GPU execution and blocking all LU work in order to copy a resource between a few stage, perhaps this is a render target we want to use in a, in a, in a later post-process effect, we can issue a, a synchronous copy with our DMA engine and do some other useful graphics work in, in the meantime. So that's a very simple use case uh, that gives good performance improvement. Uh, another one is to be able to do a synchronous compute together with graphics. And the key idea here is that you'll have some, um, some graphics stages uh, where you probably are bound not really by LU, but by, by the, the overall raw for, or be bound by memory. For example, shadow map rendering is usually not that LU heavy. Uh, so in this case, we've moved the uh, lighting to be able to run in parallel with our shadow map rendering, and th there's a bunch of small async compute work there of processing just a very LU heavy lighting that can be run at the same time and, and fill up the machine better and get out some extra performance from that. Um, yeah. Another interesting use case, uh, we haven't really done this yet, this is more, more R&D or just uh, thinking about it, is uh, to be able to run multiple compute kernels uh, in parallel and have them collaborate with each other. Instead of creating a large uh, compute kernel, sort of like a Uber kernel that can do a little bit of everything within it, uh, you can create, uh, in this case, like a producer-consumer type of pattern where one compute kernel uh, is generating work for another one, uh, for example, doing your own custom yeah, rasterization, conservative rasterization, or, or or anything really. And this can go on at the same time as, uh, as, order, as graphics works is, uh, is, is issued as well. And finally, uh, one use case that we've been a little bit inspired about uh, from, from P3 is essentially, uh, we have the graphics pipeline issuing individual draw calls and processing them and rendering them. Uh, and these are essentially atomic units that we send to the graphics, um, uh, to the graphics pipeline. And we could use compute to, to simplify the, the amount of geometry that we're sending down. Instead of having the CPU issue more draw calls, you can have the GPU call its geometry or process it in, in different ways. Having a dis big destructible building actually is quite a lot of redundant geometry that, we've been, that we're rendering for each view uh, that takes extra graphics, ti graphics time. So here you can have the, have the GPU helping the GPU, which is quite interesting. And I think you'll see going forward that uh, game engines will sort of move to a little bit more to this model overall where you build large uh, GPU job graphs and move away from single uh, sequential submission just as we've done on the CPU uh, quite, a, quite a while ago. And which um, these, um, this, these cues uh, also sort of bring me into more general work of, uh, well, general area of, of programmability uh, when it comes to Bantle. It's a pretty uh, important aspect and a very, simple uh, area is actually multi-GPU. Uh, well, it's supposed to be a simple area, but uh, traditionally it's, there's really not that great APIs to, to work with here, but with these queues that I described fit very well into the multi-GPU territory where you can have multiple, uh, multiple GPUs in the same system and all of them just expose their own queues. So you'll, in this case of four GPUs, you'll have four different graphics pipelines, uh, all, all that can run independently. In this case, with different memory, which can be a little bit tricky, but uh, you can implement your own alternate frame, re frame rendering here to get uh, good uh, utilization all of, the things, all of these. Or you could do something a little bit more exotic. Um, like, for example, one use case we're interested in is to be able to see if we could build a, like workstations with like four or even eight uh, GPUs for really super high-end uh, rendering and simulation, not necessarily for, for just consumers, although there probably are some high-end consumers that want this also, but uh, mostly for, for ourselves to play around with, to see what we can do with 40 teraflops in the same machine. So in this case, uh, uh, you could have a, 
build these large, uh, <coughs> large uh, job graphs um, that are described on the GPU with this, these different queues and have them execute on, on individual, uh, individual GPU, GPUs. And alternate frame rendering typically breaks down if you use this many, so you'll probably split up the work a little bit differently. Uh, and another way of using queues uh, that's a very different use case is just for low latency rendering, which is very important for VR or for uh, competitive games, where you can have an, a sort of a latency optimized way of, of executing these job graphs and try just to finish off uh, work as quickly as possible. You sort of have to balance uh, memory transfer versus uh, compute in this case. Uh, a VR case is also very, sim very simple if you have just two GPUs. You just dedicate one per GPU and, and you should work to them completely simultaneously instead of having individual frames going to e each one. Um, there are also a couple of new mechanisms that gets enabled by Mantle uh, that GPUs also have. Uh, and one is um, command buffer predication and, and flow control. It's sort of a more advanced way than draw indirect or, or dispatch indirect where the GPU can affect or, or skip uh, work that's been submitted to it. Uh, we have, have a bunch of ideas of how we can use this for, for more sort of advanced uh, variable uh, workloads and, and advanced uh, culling optimizations. Uh, for example, you can, uh, thanks to another mechanism, uh, where you can write uh, occlusion query results uh, directly into a GPU buffer uh, without, and use that on the GPU without having to go through the CPU, you can implement your own uh, predicated rendering by, well, you render a Z buffer, you issue some occlusion tests for that, and directly based on that results, uh, you, you, you decide on how, how the GPU frame will be, be rendered. Or you can just use it for solving like age old problems of, of lens flares and visibility of them where you, here the GPU will actually know in the same frame if, if, if the, specific lens is visible or not, instead of having going through a multi-frame uh, round trip over the CPU. Um, and a key mechanism as, uh, or, or for programmability with Mantle is uh, bindless resources. Uh, uh, this is sort of an, uh, just an, an extension of the descriptor set support, and it's a really quite important uh, key programmability, well, program, programming primitive, I think, uh, going forward, because it allows shaders to uh, select uh, resources uh, and decide which resources to use uh, directly themselves instead of having this sort of static binding that's set up up front from the CPU. Uh, so you could use this um, uh, for just general optimizations, for example, just sending less data down uh, from, from the CPU, uh, or you can use it for, for building more complex data structures. And there's some algorithms that are very difficult to build with the current structures. For example, if you do a ray tracer uh, or, or even some deferred texturing scenarios uh, where you want to have a material representation, so for for ray tracing, perhaps you, you trace through your ray and you'll hit multiple different types of uh, triangles and all of them can have different materials. So you need to be able to, from a data structure in your shader, be able to look up exactly what material you're using. Uh, and this is possible to get with, uh, with, with bindless. Um, so that's really quite exciting. Um, and that was, uh, that was it for the programmability aspect. Uh, there's also quite a few <coughs> uh, com components when it comes to actual platforms that, uh, and platforms that Mantle can run on. So today, uh, Mantle is for Windows. Uh, we get really good improvements uh, both for Windows 7 and for, for Windows 8 um, when it comes to performance and, and all, with all of these controls. And it's a little bit of an investment in initial development time for it, but for us at least, it's, it's really well worth it. Uh, though, one have to say that the DX and GL is really the, the, the industry standards today, and we, we do absolutely need them for, for platforms that do not support Mantle. And there's also a strong use case to continue to use them for, well, for developers that sort of don't need or not really want this type of uh, extra controller performance. Perhaps you're targeting a, a completely different type of, of, of topics there. Um, so we, we do have to build and continue to maintain our, our uh, OpenGL and, and DX um, uh, rendering path, uh, but we really try and avoid uh, limiting ourselves uh, to what we can do in those APIs. Uh, so I think going forward, the main things that we sort of dri drive the, the designs that we have in Frostbite um, <coughs> and the type of optimizations we do will, will be what we can do with Mantle and also what we can do with, uh, with PS4. PS4 uh, has also its own graphics API that's really quite programmable and, and uh, really quite uh, a lot of good control and, and performance from it. Uh, so we can share uh, concepts and methods and various types of, of high level optimizations uh, between those and, and, and see where, where we end up with that. Um, this is quite exciting. And there are also a couple of other platforms that I think of, is, of, is of interest. Um, li both Linux and Mac would be a really good fit, in my view, for, for Mantle. Uh, it would enable us to uh, bring up our full engine and our full render a lot quicker than it would be w with uh, OpenGL, and I think the end result would be quite superior in that regard also. Uh, that said, we are building an OpenGL renderer today uh, within Frostbite. <laughs> but. Uh, 
there are, there are a bunch of other bunch of use cases for this. For example, the workstations that I mentioned it would be quite nice to actually run those uh, on Linux, uh, where you have more control of, of these quite uh, quite specific things. There are also R and D one could do on these platforms, and not be limited by what you can do with VDDM. And finally, games, uh, especially with uh, Steam OS uh, coming out there next year. Uh, that together with Mantle would be a really, really powerful combination that would be interesting to, to, to try out. Um, there's also a couple of other types of platforms. Uh, the mobile architectures uh, that exist today are really getting quite closer uh, to, to desktop GPUs in, in capabilities, not necessarily in performance uh, uh, just yet. Um, and it's in mobile, you're even more constrained by both power, bandwidth, and, and overall performance. So having a, a lower level API that can really utilize the hardware and allow applications to, to play more nicely with it, with it would be uh, a very interesting topic there. And I think it's a major opportunity uh, with Mantle to, if you would have mobile SOC vendors or, or platform providers <coughs> using it, it could really leapfrog what you can do both on, on DL, GL and on DX. Um, and Finally, uh, the pink elephant in the room uh, when it comes to Mantle uh, is uh, multi-vendor support. Uh, and Mantle is really designed to be a, a thin hardware uh, abstraction. It's actually it's not tied to the AMD's uh, GCN architecture. It's been designed with that in mind, the actual architecture and what we can do with it and, and actually expose that, but it is a hardware abstraction. And one that is forward, forward compatible and one that has uh, extensions for uh, for things that are really too architect uh, really architecture or platform specific uh, functionality. A little bit similar to GL here, but a lot lower level type of uh, extensions. Um, and I would say that, I, well, I, I believe that Mantle would actually be a much more efficient graphics API for, for the other vendors as well. And it would be really interesting to, to investigate that more, in more detail once we're sort of done proving out that Mantle uh, works and, uh, with, with, with our games. Um, and most of the functionality that I talked about today can actually be supported on, on most of the modern uh, GPUs. Uh, so I would like to see a, a future version of Mantle that is supported on all platforms and on all uh, modern GPUs. This is a pretty tall order, but we're going to try and make a push for it at least and see, 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 see where we, we get. Uh, ideally, it should become an, an, an active industry standard with multiple IHVs and ISVs sort of collaborating on it and really enable us developers to easily write uh, games and complex game engines uh, <coughs> with, with great performance and programmability sort of on, on all platforms, including mobile, ideally, in the future. Um, and finally, uh, I have a, a bit of a section of some of the work we've been doing uh, with, uh, uh, with Frostbite specifically. So first of all, we have a video. Uh, in case you haven't seen the, the work we've been doing with uh, Belt before. If you can play the video. So that was some Belfi 4 uh, footage from our multiplayer. This, this is, that was not running Mantle, that was just uh, in general uh, to describe what the game is. Uh, we're working on uh, a Mantle renderer uh, for Belfi 4 and for Frostbite in general. So we've been working quite a bit on, on bringing up our core renderer. Uh, it's actually quite interesting that it's, it's looking a lot, the actual code looks a lot closer than, uh, with, than um, the code looks a lot closer to how the rendering API on PS4 works than it works, looks at on DX11, thanks to the explicit memory control and, and sort of the quite low level primitives that we were working with. Uh, and we have quite a lot of different rendering effects and techniques that we're implementing for BF4 right now uh, that, well, they're already in the game, but they're only works for the, for the existing paths, so they're bringing up on Mantle. Uh, we've been working quite a bit on various CPU optimizations, like the parallel dispatch that, I, that I've talked about and the descriptor sets that should give some really good performance improvements, and also doing some GPU optimizations of specifically with MSA and just minimizing transitions. And, and ideally, we'd like to do a, a bunch of more R&D and seeing what, what type of more GPU optimizations we can do. Uh, as we have to memory, manage all memory ourselves, that's also a pretty big part uh, of the work. Um, and same with multi-GPU, we have to implement our fully ourselves. Uh, we already have pretty good multi-GPU scaling, but uh, um, this should 
This should run even better because usually with multi-GPU you get CPU bound in, in many cases actually. And it hasn't been that much work actually. It's, it's been spent around two months of, uh, well, we'll be spending around two months of, of work on bringing this up and we're targeting an update in, in late December. Um, and after this, we actually have another game that we're going to uh, bring over. So we have a video of that one also. Thanks, uh, we're really happy about that the game. It's, it's pretty awesome. Uh, it plays very well and looks really, really nice. Uh, it's a very different rendering from, from BF4. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think uh, Mantle will actually be a really good fit from that. We'll, we'll bring over the work that we've been doing on BF4 and the work we've been doing on, uh, well, on Frostbite in general with all of this, and it should just work uh, out of the box uh, running on Mantle on this. And we'll focus a little bit more work on, on sort of APU performance on this because it's a little bit more I shouldn't say casual title because it's still 24 player multiplayer, but uh, it's a little bit more, even more accessible title. Uh, so we want it to run really, really, really well on laptops. Uh, actually, BF4 runs quite well even now on, on the new Kaveri, but uh, this will run even better. Uh, so that, that would be quite fun to, look, to work at. Uh, and then going forward in the future, um, the, go the goal for us is actually, uh, the work we've been doing in BF4 and then later with Plants vs. Zombies is just going straight into the main Frostbite versions that we have. So all of our Frostbite games going forward will be designed with Mantle. And we have around 15 games in development uh, across all of EA. Uh, and this is some, an example of some of the studios and, and, and games that we have, uh, the ones that I can share today. Um, and going forward, we'll also like to do some uh, even more advanced uh, sort of R&D and, and experimentation with Mantle and what type of rendering use cases we can have. Uh, the games I've talked about, those are games we're porting over. What, what happens when you actually design a game from start with it based on uh, base with engine and based on what we can do on consoles and with Mantle? That would be extremely, extremely interesting to see. And we also would like, to, uh, just to reiterate, uh, we'd really like to be able to have a future where we can have this on all platforms and on all vendors. So that's all for me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>